Christine, thank you so much for that in introduction. Legislative colleagues, uh, Mayor Fougere, uh, Chiefs, uh, uh, all of those in attendance this evening, our sponsors, um, thank you so much for being here this evening. We know there are many places you could be, as Minister Mikowski had mentioned, and we are ever so thankful that you are here. Christine, that introduction, it was, it was wonderful and it was humbling, and I, I would just say this right back at you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a tremendous honour. It's a high honour and a great privilege for me to serve alongside all of my colleagues, but in particular, the honour that I have to serve alongside uh, Christine Tell in your government. She brings a strong voice to the table as serving as Minister of Corrections and Policing, serving as the MLA for Regina Wascana Plains. She brings honesty, she brings compassion, she brings common sense, and she brings a certain amount of toughness that comes from serving as a police officer for, for 25 years. Christine, by the way, is, is also a strong advocate for empowering women and, and girls. Along with Laura Ross, she, she helps lead an annual leadership workshop for young girls and their families. Christine and Laura truly believe that strong girls grow up to be strong women. And strong women build strong communities. But back to Christine's toughness. I'm told in the legislature that there's a, a number of young staffers that sometimes will debate which MLAs they would, they would want on their side if, if heaven forbid there was ever a Royal Rumble in caucus and some days it feels like there might be one, right Gene? There are some obvious choices I think that we would look for if this what if Royal Rumble scenario ever actually occurred. Gene Mikowski, of course, he's big as a mountain, of course you'd want him on your side. Greg Burkett, he wears cowboy boots, he could do some damage with those. But apparently the, the top picks for these young staffers, uh, number one is Lyle Stewart, simply because he's Lyle. But also Christine Tell, because she's been in, in some tough situations as a police officer. She's arrested uh, many people, many bad people actually. And quite frankly, you know, I, if I was in a Royal Rumble in caucus, and we haven't been in one yet, but who knows, I would want both of them on my side as well. And I'm quite happy and pleased that they are on our side in the Legislative Assembly, representing all of you in this room and representing the people in this great province that we are able to reside. There's some other folks here this evening that, that I would like to thank as well, beginning with our sponsors. You heard the list, it was listed off, it's a long one. And it is just tremendous support and we are so grateful for those generous contributions year in and year out and thank you for your sponsorship. Thank you to each and every sponsor here this evening. I also want to acknowledge members of the dinner committee chaired by Lee Elliott, ladies and gentlemen of the dinner, dinner committee and they were mentioned earlier. You have done an absolutely incredible job this year. Thank you so very much for your efforts. Thank you to Patrick Bundrock and his team at the party headquarters. Not just for the work that you do on, on these events that we put on, but for, for the work that you do each and every day. The last few years have been busy ones for Patrick and, and the team at the party office and they have done the job and I dare say they have done the job well. And thank you to the folks that have prepared our meal for us here this evening and thank you most importantly to each of you that have taken time to attend. This evening my wife isn't able to be with us, Krista um, isn't here, but I want to just take a moment to thank her for all of her love and her support. As we know, as my colleagues know, none of us serve in these capacities alone. We serve here at the blessing and with the support of our family, and I most certainly am thankful for the support that I receive from my wife, Krista. She's actually the unsung hero in our family. She keeps the home fires burning in, in Shelbrook where we still reside. She, she operates her own business in that community and, and now we're moving into that next stage of our life, not the next stage where one of the spouses becomes the premier, but we're empty nesters now. Our, our son has, has moved out a number of years ago. He lives and works as an engineer in Saskatoon and our daughter is in completing her third year of a 
of a communication disorders degree at Minot State University. And so it, at home, it's just Krista and, and sometimes myself, and, and always uh, we have a dog. We have a dog, a dog named Duchess, of all things. This dog is a, is a Bichon Freeze who eats anything, eats everything, quite frankly, and somehow survives this, this condition that it has. And folks, I, I have to confess to you in this day, I don't have a very strong relationship with that dog. I love the people that love that dog, but I'm not there. We don't connect. But I, I get a message from my wife. Uh, I've had it for a number of years, and it's been, it's been pretty clear, and it goes like this. It's, Scott, get with the program. You need to build a better relationship with Duchess if you're going to continue to hang around here. So I'm trying. I've been trying for over a decade, and I'll keep you posted on how this relationship continues to progress. Before I go on, I do want to, I want to acknowledge and thank the members of, of the Government Caucus that are here this evening. We have more than 25 Saskatchewan Party MLAs, your MLAs, that are, that are in attendance here this, e this evening, and I would say they are an exceptional t team of, of men and women of whom I am so very proud to serve beside. When you look at what these folks have done in their current careers, in their, in their past careers, in their community work, or or just simply in their pastime. We are so fortunate in this province to have a group such as this serving you in this room and serving the rest of the people living in Saskatchewan. In our caucus, we have car dealers, a caterer, a broadcaster, a baker, a former bouncer. We have teachers and a trucker. We have lawyers, farmers, real estate agents, pilots, preachers, at least one professor. We have a guy who played tackle, guard, and center for the Rough Riders. We have people in our caucus who have served as mayors, town councillors, Reeves and RM councillors, city councillors, school board trustees. We have people in our caucus who speak French, Italian, Russian, Ukrainian, Punjabi, Urdu, German, Hungarian, and some of them even speak English from time to time. In fact, so many languages are spoken in our caucus that I was somewhat seriously thinking of proposing to the Prime Minister that he should outsource the foreign services to the province of Saskatchewan. Foreign relations, as we know, isn't, isn't a, in the provincial purview, but given what's happening in some of our key markets these days, I think we might have the opportunity to actually improve some of those relations. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this evening I want to provide an update on, on where things stand in Saskatchewan from, from our perspective. And also I want to talk about the choice that we will be facing in, in this province and, and in this nation in the months and, and in the years to come as we move closer to some important election dates. As you know, we wrapped up our spring sitting of the legislature here in Regina a couple of weeks ago. And for certain, the highlight this spring was the balanced budget that was presented by our Minister of Finance, Donna Harpower. It was a balanced budget that continues to make key investments in services and in infrastructure while controlling our spending and keeping our taxes low. The budget was the culmination of a, of a three-year plan that was put forward by Premier Brad Wall. And tonight I want to acknowledge and I want to thank Brad Wall for his leadership that he provided during his entire time as Premier, but particularly in the days after the resource prices plunged in this province in 2014. Thank you, Brad. We all remember well the billion dollar hole in our budget that we had uh, that particular year. We could have taken the all too familiar path to, to deal with, with this challenge. We could have decided to to post deficits as, as far as our eye could see. We've seen that happen elsewhere in Canada, perpetual deficits one after the other, and we know what those bring. A steady erosion of our services and a heavy burden for, for future generations, for our children's generation. Premier Wall, Cabinet and Caucus, we, we were adamant that we weren't going to go down that path. And so we put in place a three-year plan to balance the budget and in doing so, we had to make some very difficult decisions. Because as it turns out, budgets don't actually balance themselves. 
There was some opposition. We had to make some changes and tweaks along the way. I think of the PST on, on insurance products. I think of the, the reinvestment we had to discuss with respect to education and health care. But for the most part, with your support, we were able to, to stay the course. Much deserved of this thanks goes to our former finance minister who is here this evening, Mr. Kevin Doherty. His work in conjunction with the commitment of our current finance minister, Donna Harpower, has got us to where we are today, to the right balance for the province of Saskatchewan. Our current finance minister, Donna Harpower, is, is filled with common sense. She is an absolutely steady voice, and she is respected by colleagues on both sides of the legislature. And as it turns out, Donna is also pretty good at saying no which is an important trait as Minister of Finance. In that way, Donna brings to mind uh, a certain British Prime Minister. You might recall when Margaret Thatcher was criticized for some of the choices that, that she had made, and there were, there were some in her party that were suggesting that she should take a U-turn. And the Prime Minister Thatcher at that point in time uttered those famous words, and I quote, U-turn if you like, the lady is not for turning. Well, I can tell you the Iron Lady from Humboldt is not for turning when it comes to ensuring that Saskatchewan is on the right fiscal path in this province. And so our budget was balanced, and it is the right balance for Saskatchewan. It is the right balance as we continue to invest and to support a growing population in our communities. There are now one, more than 1.16 million people calling Saskatchewan home, an increase of more than 160,000 people in the last decade. We have added in this province the equivalent of two Prince Alberts, two Moose Jaws, and a Swift Current. This year's budget included a record investment in our education system, investing directly in our classrooms, uh, included a record investment in our health care delivery more than we have ever had in the history of Saskatchewan. We increased our investment for mental health, for example, and our mental health and addictions investment was up by $30 million to over $400 million this year. This represents the largest investment in not only mental health services in the province, but as part of the largest investment in health care delivery services in the history of Saskatchewan. You add to this, You add to this the new and expanded facility and services at the Saskatchewan Hospital North Battleford. This investment was alongside another important investment that we were able to make in providing $23 million in operational funding to the new Jim Pattison Children's Hospital, which is set to open in just a few short months in the city of Saskatoon. Finally, in this province, our province, we will have a state-of-the-art children's hospital. In this budget, in this fiscal year, we continue to invest in the expansion of, of child care spaces for our young families and our communities across Saskatchewan. We provided planning dollars for new hospitals in Prince Albert and in Weyburn. We provided funding for the consolidation and replacement of St. Pius and Argyle schools right here in, in Regina. There's funding in this year's budget for a new joint use school facility in the city of Moose Jaw, much needed facility in Moose Jaw. We're moving ahead with the redesign of our income assistance program here in Saskatchewan. Our Minister of Social Services, Paul Merriman, is heading this effort up. You may know that Paul served for a period of time as the Executive Director of the Saskatoon Food Bank. Paul understands, better than many of us often, the challenges facing people that at times are receiving social assistance. And I think he'll tell you that there aren't many people in this province who want to be receiving this assistance. Most people are looking for the dignity of a job. They want the independence and the pride that comes with, with earning a living. And the new Saskatchewan Income Support Program will give people the opportunity to achieve just that, that independence, and they will gain the dignity most of us all too often take for granted. 
We're continuing to invest in infrastructure in this year's budget. $2.7 billion for projects in executive government and, and the Crown sector, building on $26 billion that has been invested since 2007, $26 billion in roads, in schools, in bridges, in hospitals, in long-term care homes, in power plants, in water treatment facilities, in communities right across this great place. I think it is entirely fair to say that no government in the history of Saskatchewan has invested more in infrastructure than the current government. This includes investments like the Regina Bypass, the largest infrastructure ever in the history of Saskatchewan, to be completed this fall on time and on budget. And Gord Wyant loves when we say that. A project that has already improved the safety for Saskatchewan families, and that is the focus. And here's what Randy Schultz, the White City Fire Chief, told the CBC a number a while ago, and he said, and I quote, before the bypass construction, I couldn't tell you how many accident scenes we were on where we were using the jaws of life. Now, I can't tell you the last time we used the jaws of life, end quote. According to SGI, the number of accidents on Highway 1, Highway 1 between Regina and Belgonia is down 75% compared to 2013. The Regina Bypass has improved traffic flow around the city, yes, but much more importantly, it is keeping our families safe as they access our capital city in this province, and that's something we can all be proud of, an investment we can get behind. Ladies and gentlemen, we think there is a lot to like in this budget. And so do the credit agencies. This is the assessment of one of those agencies, the DBRS on the state of Saskatchewan finances this year. And I quote, the commitment to prudent fiscal policy along with the pace of fiscal consolidation stands out among provinces. While the economic outlook is not without challenges, the bu this budget the budget outlook is much improved and the credit profile has stabilized." End quote. Well, DBRS is right. We are facing some economic headwinds, but there is light on the horizon. Saskatchewan just added 18,000 new full-time jobs year over year, most of those in the private sector. We've seen now nine consecutive months of, of job growth. Wholesale trade is up, the second largest increase among provinces in the nation. Merchandise exports are up, all measurements that we watch. Average weekly wages are growing faster in this province than, than anywhere in Canada. So to summarize all of these statistics, we have more jobs, we have higher exports, higher wholesale trade, rising wages, a growing population, more public investment to support that growth, and slowly strengthening resource prices. I don't think it's an overstatement for us to say that things are starting to look up in Saskatchewan. But there are times when you wouldn't know that from the political debate that, that occurs here from time to time. There's more gloom predicted. That's an actual headline from a newspaper story that was published in this province in 2001, in 2001 when there, there was plenty of gloom in Saskatchewan. Real gloom, I might add. There are days you could actually make make this forecast actually each and every day just before a question period at the legislature. More gloom predicted. Well, with my colleagues, your Saskatchewan party MLAs, I would say there's nothing that could be further from the truth. We are hopeful about our province's future. Although we're not naive, we know we have challenges in Saskatchewan. But we continue to believe that we can address these problems by working together, like we always have. But on the NDP side of the aisle, it's, it's dark, it's dismal, it's dreary, it's ever so gloomy over there. And I know the role of the opposition is to highlight the weaknesses of government. That is their role. I know the role of the opposition is to, to emphasize the negative of, of government, but I would be the first to admit, actually, that 
that we make mistakes in government. All governments, all governments do. But it seems to me that when you criticize the government, there should be some connection between reality, however flimsy that connection may be. But today, what we see, what we see is the gulf between their perception of what's going on and, and our perception of what's going on is so wide that we might, we might as well be living on different planets. It's a starkly different worldview. We have positive versus negative. We have optimism versus pessimism. We have hope versus despair. In the broader context, we believe there is an, an unmistakable arc of progress in our province in Saskatchewan that stretches back to the very beginning of this province. And that arc of progress can be seen in the world as a whole. Things are getting better here. It's indisputable, yet we rarely identify with it and all too often we forget to acknowledge that things are getting better. In 1820, 94% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Virtually everyone lived in extreme poverty in 1820. In 1990, 35% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. In 2015, that number was under 10%. According to the United Nations, poverty has been reduced more in the past 50 years than it has been in the past 500. Since 1994, more than 1.25 billion people have escaped extreme poverty on this earth. That works out to about 137,000 people a day who have been removed from that ex extreme poverty. And I would put forward that Saskatchewan has played an outsized role in this incredible story. Saskatchewan is making the world a better place. Saskatchewan is a force for good in this world. Think of what we have contributed. Think of what we have contributed in agriculture alone. More than 400 commercial crop varieties from this province have been developed, including crops like canola. Think of the air seeder, now the air drill. We invented it here. And now we export these drills all around the globe. We export these drills along with augers and balers and headers and mulchers and mowers and, and swathers. Zero till technology. We're the pioneers in this province. And today Saskatchewan's crop soils are a carbon sink because of this very innovation. In part due to zero till innovation, crop agriculture in Saskatchewan is, is now carbon neutral. To my knowledge, there is no other area in the world that can make the claim that we can with respect to that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no exaggeration to say that agricultural research and innovation in this province has improved and saved the lives of millions around the world. Think of the potash we produce. Millions of tons of potash produced in this province, shipped overseas each and every year. How much more food is available in the fast-growing nations of Asia today thanks to potash that is being mined by Nutrien and Mosaic and, and now K plus S in Saskatchewan? World-class companies working to feed a very hungry world. Think of the uranium mined by Cameco and Urano, the richest uranium deposits in the world in this province. Clean energy, generating clean baseload electricity, avoiding millions of tons of emissions in our world. Think of the advancements in energy research. We produce in this province some of the most sustainable oil in the world using enhanced oil recovery methods, for example. The progress in Saskatchewan has been remarkable. And our innovation and our success will continue. In fact, I would say it will speed up. I would say things are going to get better. But there is this unfortunate human tendency that, that we have to believe that things can only get worse. You see this in the, the chronic pessimism, pessimism influencing the debate about climate change in this country. Now let me be clear before I get into this part, climate change is real. It's happening, and humans are contributing. 
We need to address climate change globally. But are we on the brink of an apocalypse? And will a carbon tax save us from this apocalypse? The Trudeau government thinks so, the Saskatchewan NDP thinks so, even though there is absolutely no evidence that a carbon tax will actually reduce emissions in any way. To me, it seems that both the federal Liberals and the Saskatchewan NDP have conflated a, a very serious environmental challenge into an existential crisis, into an impending catastrophe. And this is not helpful to the conversation that we should be having. It allows Prime Minister Trudeau and his Environment Minister Catherine McKenna to cast themselves as crusading environmental superheroes. In fact, here they are. That's a real photo. It's actually either from last year's Halloween or last week's cabinet meeting, I'm not sure which. The point is this, virtue signaling is no substitute for sound policy making. This is what drives the Trudeau carbon tax, this is what drives Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines Bill, this is what is driving Bill C-48, the, the No More West Coast Tankers Bill. If you are concerned in this room that the Liberals and the Saskatchewan NDP, all of the NDP, would sacrifice thousands of jobs across this country, some of them in this province so that they can feel good about themselves, you should be. Because it is a concern. It's a concern of mine, and I would put forward it's completely, completely unnecessary. In Saskatchewan, in this great province, we have a plan to address climate change. It's called a plan of prairie resilience. It's a plan that will result in Real, real emissions reductions without an ineffective, destructive carbon tax on our families and our industry. It's a comprehensive strategy that recognizes the reality of, of this province. It's an approach that is driven by the brilliance of our world-class researchers and engineers. It's an approach that is driven by innovation of our agricultural producers and our entrepreneurs and communities across Saskatchewan. And it's a vision that is rooted in optimism and hope. And why shouldn't we be optimistic in this province? We live in a place where the intensity of greenhouse gas emissions has actually dropped 9% since 2005, all the while our, our GDP has grown 24%. We continue to take carbon emissions out of each product that we produce, making Saskatchewan products among the most sustainable products in the world. I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago where I had the opportunity to meet with, uh, with Andrew Wheeler, the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. He was adamant in our conversation that the USA is producing the most sustainable energy in the world. And I, I said, you likely are next to Saskatchewan. We live in a province where we have innovative resource companies operating here as we speak. Innovative resource companies like Pre Crescent Point Energy who are now operating zero emission well sites using solar power. We live in a country where energy intensity, the amount of energy that we use to make things has dropped 25% since 1990. We live in a world where CO2 emissions from new cars are at a record low, while fuel economy is at a record high. Our vehicles that we drive have never been more efficient. We're getting more efficient and more productive in our industries each and every day. And we're doing it in this province. And this is why we should be optimistic about us helping meet the challenge of climate change. We can deal with climate change the same way that we have addressed a, a host of other challenges by harnessing our human ingenuity and, and by working together. Ladies and gentlemen, back in the 1990s, we were having this very same debate, what to do about climate change. But back then, it was it was referred to as global warming. Alberta Premier of the day, Ralph Klein, was involved in that conversation and he made this observation in a speech that he delivered in Toronto. And I quote Premier Klein, this great country is more than capable of contributing to, to the global warming solution. The resourcefulness of this country is unmatched in the world. If we come together, 
if we commit ourselves to, to realistic goals, then we will make a difference in the battle against global warming. We will reinforce our position as a world leader in environmental stewardship, and we will contribute in a way that makes every Canadian proud." End quote. Well, Premier Klein was correct. He was correct then, and it's true today. Friends, let me close with this. In Saskatchewan, it is entirely possible for us to reconcile our, our environmental responsibilities with, with a growing economy, and we will. We can do this. Actually, we must do this. Because there are people in this province that are, are counting on us to do just that. People like Justin, Lyle, John, Dennis, Greg, and, and Michael. Six fine gentlemen who moved into a new home earlier this year in Regina, the new Christian Horizons group home. Justin, Lyle, John, Dennis, Greg, and Michael were residents of Valley View Center in, in Moose Jaw. Back in 2012, we announced that we would transition Valley View residents out of that institutional setting and, and into new homes in their communities. We worked with the residents, we, we worked with their families, we worked with community groups to ensure that the transition was, was carried out as smoothly as, as possible. And now, 36 new group homes have been built or are under construction in, in 15 communities across Saskatchewan and the transition will be complete by the end of this year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have new neighbours and new friends from Valley View that are living across this province. A province that is so much richer for their presence in our communities. This took some resources in government. This year alone we've invested $586 million in programs for people that are living with disabilities. That's a 173% increase over what was provided in 2007 when we formed government. 173%. It is only because of a growing economy, because of what you in this room and others are doing each and every day in this province that we were able to make that type of an investment. It's the only reason an investment that would give these fine gentlemen the dignity of their own home. An investment that could give them hope. And it's been said that hope is a dimension of the soul and an orientation of the heart and I believe in Saskatchewan that this is our natural disposition. We are inclined to hope. We are optimistic by nature. We know that today is better than yesterday. We know that tomorrow will bring a future that is bright and, and is bursting with promise and, and opportunity for us and our family. My friends, that, that future is ours if we want it. It's there for the taking. And I suggest we take it. Let's make it happen. And let's make it happen together. Thank you so much for coming this evening and thank you for listening and God bless our great province of Saskatchewan.